Welcome, young investors, to our YIS broadcast with the Morgan Housel. Uh, Morgan Housel is a partner at the Collaborative Fund, which is an early stage venture capital fund. Um, he's also a former columnist um, at Motley Fool. Morgan, we've, uh, we've featured many of your articles in the past. Our, the, I mean, the kids just love your articles and they love Motley Fool. Um, Morgan is also a, a former columnist at the Wall Street Journal. He's the two-time winner of the Best in Business Award for the Society of American Business Editors and Writers, two-time finalist for the Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Business and Financial Journalism, selected as the Columbia Journalism Review for Best Business Writing in 2012. 2013, he was a Scripps Howard uh, finalist for the Scripps Howard Award. And, um, you know, and, and as an investor, I can just say that Morgan Housel is one of those one of those people that when he writes, everyone reads, and he's just thoughtful. He's a student of the markets, a student of history, and it's just an honor, Morgan, to have you have you on today. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for that. It's certainly an honor to be here tonight. So I'm looking forward to chatting with everyone. This is fun. Great. And um, and we did an introduction at the beginning, but we have students from Agora High School, Thousand Oaks High School. Um, Westlake High School from Southern California, who are some of the student leaders of Young Investor Society. And um, thank you all for being on. And, and I'll let them ans ask um, a lot of the questions today, but I will kick it off, Morgan, to you. Um, I guess the first question, if you could just kind of a big picture question, um, talk about the lessons that you've learned. So you've covered the markets and you're a student of of finance and investing. Um, talk about the lessons that you've learned over the you know, more than a decade that you've been studying the markets. Um, uh, what are the key things that you've learned? What would you, what would you pass on as kind of a kickoff uh, to this discussion? Yeah, so I would say the, 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 the biggest kind of high level lesson that I've learned in the past 10 or 15 years, and I really started my career in investing uh, in 2008, which is when the economy melted down, markets melted down. It was the end of the world in 2008. That was really when I began. So my career has really yeah. started there. Uh, it started in the meltdown, and then we've had this big bull market ever since. But then, of course, I've, I've tried to be kind of a student of history as well, looking back at what has the market done over the last century and what have, what have different global economies done over time. And I would say a big lesson from all of that, both of our recent history and kind of the broader approach in history, is that investing, I think, is often taught as a math-based topic. It's taught as formulas and datas, and you take, your, you take your data, you put it into your formula, and you get an answer, and your answer tells you what to do. And it's kind of how it's thought about and taught very often. And a big, a big lesson for me is that I, I've really noticed that investing is much more of a, a soft behavioral science. That's how I view it. It's really, I, I always, the, the, the best way that I, I, I think I can put it is finance really is not the study of finance. It's the study of human behavior. That's what investing is. It's a study of how do people in big groups respond to incentives? How, how do we respond to risk? And that's really what investing is to me. So I've tried to research investing and think about investing, not as data and formulas, but as, uh, as, as, as just the study of how do people in big groups respond when they're to threats and incentives. And I think when you view it through that lens, you start thinking about investing uh, in, in, in ways that are influenced by psychology and sociology and history and politics and all kinds of different fields that kind of fit under this umbrella of human behavior rather than just this little tiny umbrella of finance and formulas. And it's not to denigrate the, 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 fine, the formulas part of it. That's a really important part of investing. But investing is such a broader topic, just finance. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, with that, why don't we kick it off over to, uh, over to you in Southern California and uh, feel free to ask Morgan Halsell any questions that you'd like. I'll start off. Um, so I have a question. Uh, I'm kind of looking to get into investing as like, you know, a future career, not just have my career and just ask on the side. And I've been reading a lot about it and it seems like all these people have like majors in computer science and stuff. So I just want to know what role that plays 
the actual job and stuff. Because I mean, you said it's more like psychology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. So I, I would say in, in general, what you major in in college is probably not going to have a, a huge impact on your career as an investor, particularly later on. A lot of the greatest investors that I know have degrees in English and psychology and biology. And a lot of them have degrees in finance and business and economics. But it's, I mean, I, and, and this kind of gets back to what I was talking about in terms of investing being a really broad topic about human behavior. Because that's the case, you have people from a lot of different fields that end up doing really well in investment careers. And that's not the case if you want to be a doctor, then you have to go to med school. If you want to be a lawyer, you have to go to law school. Whereas investing, you have a lot of people that just throughout the course of their career, throughout the course of their education, learn a, a, a certain thing about how people behave in general, just a different view about the world. And, it, and they learn a view that teaches them something useful about investing. Now, I think it's, an, it, it's, important, uh, it's important early on in your career that you can demonstrate to potential employers that you have a clear interest uh, uh, and, and at least a short, short to midterm interest and commitment to finance. So I, you know, I, I, I would encourage people that if they are really interested in, in a career in investing, you know, if you want to major in finance or business or economics, I think that's great. But if someone said, you know, that they're interested in a career in finance and they're going to major in computer science, I would say that's great too. And if someone was wanted a career in investing and they would say, so do I need a degree in, in computer science? I would say, no, I would say, pick your degree based on what is most interesting to you because what is most interesting to you is probably what you're going to do the best at. And investing is, I think one of the few careers that no matter what you major in, I think you'll, you'll end up doing fine. If you're passionate about investing to begin with, I majored in, in finance and economics. And I can tell you with certainty that nothing that I learned in school, no direct lessons that I learned as an economics major became truly relevant in my career as investing. You know, there were maybe certain frameworks and whatnot, but there was no, I mean, I, I can't think of a single time when in my career as an investor, I've said, oh, remember I, where I learned this in my freshman year and now it's teaching me how to do, it's, ne it's never been the case. And again, I think that's not the case for other careers. Um, if, if you wanna be, and if, if, if you want to be a good computer programmer, like you, you probably need to major in, in computer science. But again, I, I, I would just go back to picking your major based off of what you're really passionate and interested in. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so what do you think would be the most valuable skill that you learned through experience in the work field? Something that can't be, you know, taught in a book or out of college, something that you've learned through working in the world of investing? Yeah, good question. So I, I would say no matter what type of investor you're going to be, one of the, the biggest skills is your ability to deal with uncomfortable situations. All investing is, is you have markets over time that, that are going to produce a good return over time. Markets are going to go up over a long period of time for looking at 10 or 20 years. But the cost of those returns, what the market is going to make you give up to earn those returns over time, is putting up and dealing with bear markets and recessions. And the market going down 10 or 20% and volatility up and down. The people who can endure that discomfort over time, I think are the ones who end up doing the best. And this gets back again, I want to keep beating a dead horse, but why, you know, why do I think investing is such a multidisciplinary field? You know, here, here, here's a, a great example of like the best investors are the ones who can endure the most discomfort and the most volatility. That is really psychology and sociology. So, I mean, I, I think if there's one skill that is hard to teach, but is absolutely imperative to successful long-term investing. It's the ability to think long-term. That's not natural for most people, and it's much easier said than done. But I think if you have a, a natural disposition towards long-term thinking, and you can really force yourself to take a longer-term view and not focus on what is the market doing this month or this year, but what's likely to happen over the next 10 or 20 years, if you can really force yourself to think like that, and again, it's very difficult for most people to do that. But if you can, I think that's probably the most important investing skill uh, that is 
hard to teach, if not impossible to teach it. I would honestly really love to hear more about your specific experience, particularly as a columnist writing about finance and how you essentially found that job and what made you interested in doing that. Yeah, yeah, great, yeah, great question. So again, I started my career, well, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. All throughout uh, college, my plan for the career was investment banking. And you kind of have to, have, to, have to go back. This is, I was in college, you know, 2004, five, six, seven. And during that time, investment banking, that was like the coolest thing to do. I, I kind of feel like it still maybe has that, that um, you know, that, that idea. But, but back in the, in the mid 2000s, there, were, there was like no better career for a finance student than investment banking. It had so much glamour to it. And you could make a lot of money and you had power as an investment banker. Like that was, that was what everyone wanted to do. So that, that's all I wanted to do was investment banking. And I got, I got an internship in investment banking in my uh, junior year. And instantly the first day, just hated it. Just couldn't stand it. And this was like my dream. This is all I ever wanted to do. And on day one, it was like, get me out of here. It was such an intense culture that was based around, I mean, it, it just felt like hazing. It was, it just felt like, I mean, it was working, <laughs> you know, working 15 or 18 hours a day, not because you needed to work 18 hours a day, just because you had a boss above you that just wanted to see you score for 18 hours kind of thing. And I just, I just deal much better if I can be in a quieter environment where I can think a problem through rather than like a, a really high pressure, high stakes environment. So it just, it just really wasn't for me. So then soon after that, I got an internship in private equity. And I, I really liked private equity. It was great. It was the, I, the, the, the culture of it was great. It was a good mix between operating a business and investing. Like it was a good mix between the two. Um, and then, but so this was, this was 2007, 2008. So then the economy blew up. And I think most of you are probably too young to remember it, but it was a really brutal time. 2008, 2009, if you were, a, if you were looking for a job in finance, 2008, 2009 was not a, a good place to be because everyone was getting laid off. All the, yep. no, none of the banks were hiring. All of, all of the hedge funds were blowing up. No one was hiring. Uh, so this, this private equity firm that I was, in, I was interning with said, hey, you know, you're a summer intern. We're not going to offer you a full-time spot. We're, just, we're not hiring anyone right now. They're laying people off. So then it was like, okay, I was, I was finishing up my senior year and I really, I, I didn't, didn't really have a job, didn't really know what I was going to do and the economy was falling apart. So I had a friend who was a writer for The Motley Fool and he said, hey, you should, you should come give this a shot. Maybe you can write about investing. And I never had any intention or plan of writing about investing, but I was very interested in finance and investing. Um, so I thought, okay, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll, I'll see if they'll hire me. They're probably not going to hire me anyways, but I'll, I'll send in my application, see what, what happens from there. And then and they, they hired me as an investment writer. I had never written about really anything before because I was an economics major, so I really didn't have to write anything. You just have to write your name on the paper, and that's all, that's all you have to prove. Were, were you a writer before, Morgan? Because no, you're a really not, great not writer. At all. Well, thanks, but no, I was not in, not in at all, in the slightest. I mean, not oh. ever. Um, wow. And then, so I, so I started there, and I think, okay, I'll, I'll do this for six months until I find another private equity job. And ended up staying for 10 years um, and really just fell in love with the process of writing. Um, you know, I've always have been, and I think always will be totally fascinated with finance and investing, but writing is something that I really fell in love with because I think everybody has a lot of thoughts uh, on their head about all kinds of different topics that they can't really put into words. Like you, like you just have feelings, but you can't put it, you don't, haven't quite put them into words. And if you sit down and force yourself to write something, that's when you really crystallize a lot of those crazy feelings that you have in your head. Uh, and it, it's just a really great way to crystallize your thoughts. Um, so this is, I, I think this is how I would frame it. And I've heard so many other writers say this too. Like when you sit down to write a piece, you really have no idea what I'm going to say because it's the process of writing it that crystallizes all those thoughts. So it's not like I have all these ideas in my head and then I spit them out on the keyboard. It's like the process of being at the keyboard is what gets all those ideas going. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I just love the process of writing 
for that. And I, I would encourage everyone, even if they're not looking for a career in writing, which most people are not, uh, to write as much as you can, whether that's just for yourself in some sort of an informal journal, or if, if you want to start a blog, or even just like being on Twitter, just forcing yourself to write and putting your thoughts on paper, I think is really important and helpful for everyone. And I, I would say too, to that point, a lot of the world's best investors are also phenomenal writers. Warren Buffett is a great writer. Benjamin Graham was a, was a great writer. Howard Marks is, is a great writer. Ronis Pabrai is a great writer. And I think that's not a coincidence. I think a lot of these people uh, are, are good writers because they force themselves to write because that's how they crystallize and clarify their investing thoughts. Yeah. Um, so how do you think uh, people who want to have a career in investing know this or want to know what to apply for like when they get out of college what specific job you know because like you said you tried investment banking didn't work and you just ended up loving your job you know right after the model school. so like, what's yeah. um, the like what do you think is i mean it's it's probably so different now from when i was leaving college but you know also I'll, I'll, I'll take you back to when i was when, when i was graduating like what were people applying for i would say if, if you look at the universe of people of, of my class that wanted to get into investing, I would say at least half of them wanted to get into and applied for to work at a large investment bank. I, I think that's probably still the case, but maybe it's not half now. Maybe it's a quarter of students want to do that. A lot of people in, in, in my class wanting to work at, at hedge funds. That was like next to investment banking. That was the second the coolest thing to do was to work at a hedge fund. And I, I, I would say what's, kind of ironic or, or even sad about that is that almost none of those two categories in banking and hedge funds are what people with a couple years of experience, I would say, were most interested in. It's like those mm. two things are the most glamorous for new students. And but then for people with five years experience, they're like, I don't want to work in investment banking anymore. And I, and and that was true for me too. Like again, after working in investment banking for six months, it was like, get me out of here. I don't, want to do this I, I, don't I don't regret that at all. I think it was a great experience to see what the financial world was like, and also to learn a lot about myself that I didn't know about what kind of working conditions I like. What what kind of culture am I? Like? What, like, how how do I like to work? Do I like being in a really high pressure environment, working with a bunch of other people in suits? Or do I like to sit at home in, in my sweatpants and write silly finance articles? Like, I didn't know that about myself back then, but I had to learn it the hard way. And I think that's true for everybody. So I, I, I would definitely say, like, what, you know, what jobs yeah. do people, people apply to? Again, I'll just go back to what, what's really interesting to you. Like, what, I, I think one way to frame it is, like, what do you think about on the weekends? What do you think about when you're not in school, when you're not thinking about jobs? When you have free time to yourself, are there finance topics that interest you? Whether it's the stock market or the economy or it's like running a small business. There's probably some investing finance job for you in one of those fields that you're interested in. And, and what you're most interested in is what you're going to do the best at. And I think, it's, I think that's, that's, that's really... That's advice that a lot of people give. It's 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 nearly cliche at this point, but it's so true. I think for anyone that's been in their career for more than five or ten years, I think most people would say, just find what you're interested in, and that's what you're going to do the best at. Cool. Thanks. Yep. And I know that you more recently became involved in. I think it's called the Collaborative Fund. That's correct? right. Yeah. yeah. I've more about that specifically yeah yeah so yes yeah, so i started the collaborative fund almost two years ago the the firm is about eight or nine years old so i didn't i didn't found it i was i, I, I came on later but, okay. but but yeah but what what we do is so it's all private market investing so it's not investing in stocks that are trading on the public market it's 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 backing young startups in a venture capital way so so young startups come to us, pitch their idea, and, and, and we and, and other investors back them early on with the idea that they'll grow up and become a, a, a more successful public company one day. And I, I think, you know, the, the difference just between private markets and public markets has, has been really interesting to me too, because they are, it's, it's, on one hand, it's exactly the same. You're investing in companies for the long run, 
and there are certain characteristics and criteria that you're looking for in the companies that you want to back. But on the other hand, like the difference between private and public markets, is just couldn't be more, more different. And the, the, the biggest difference for me, and, and one reason that I was really interested to get back into private market investment versus, versus stuff in the, the stock market uh, is what's always been the concept of long-term thinking. And like, if, if the competition is thinking about the next six months, how can we think about the next six years and, that, and using that as your competitive advantage? And it's just very hard to really be a long-term thinker in the public stock market because it's so short-term focused and like everything is happening so fast. And the time horizons that public companies can really focus on is really like the next quarter, or maybe the next two or three quarters. And there's just not a lot that you can do in terms of taking on long-term projects if a public company is really forced to think about the next quarter or two. Whereas in private markets, that's where you have investors that truly can think about the next five years and 10 years. And since you don't have you know, the squawk in your ear of the public markets of what did the market do today? Oh, the Dow's up a hundred points today. Like there's none of that in private, in private markets. So you can really just focus on how can we grow this business to the best that we can over the next five or 10 years and not have any distraction from the market. So that's, that's what I, what I really like, what I really like about it, about private markets. And then another big thesis that we have at the collaborative fund is just this idea that the companies that are, most likely to make the most value over the next 10, 20 years, the companies that are going to be the most successful are the companies that are going to do the most good in the world. And I think that's always been the case, but it's becoming more the case for not even my generation, but I think your generation, that since you've grown up with technology that most older adults did not grow up with, even if they're familiar with it, they didn't grow up with it. But since you guys grew up with it, I think your generation and to a lesser extent, my generation has less tolerance for nonsense and, uh, and misbehavior than, than other generations did. It was much easier in previous generations to be a business uh, where you could hide behind your poor business practices and no one knew how poorly you were treating your employees and no one knew how poorly you were treating your customers because it was all kind of hidden behind a curtain. Mm. And now since there is so much more information, it's just with stuff like Yelp, and, and, and Twitter, where it's just, if, if, mis, if a company misbehaves, the world's going to know about it like that. And because of that, the companies that are going to do the most, the, the companies that are, that are going to perform the best over the time are the companies that are truly treating everyone under their roof, whether that is their customers or their employees or their suppliers, the best. So I think there are a lot of, you know, some, some examples of this. I think in, in the last year, you know, you have Uber that's kind of not imploded, but Uber's had a pretty tough year in the past 12 months because a lot of their business practices came to light and they were treating people pretty poorly, treating their employees really poorly, particularly females, treating a lot of their drivers poorly, treating some of their customers poorly. And then on the other hand, you have Lyft, which is almost an identical company in terms of services that they provide. Lyft and Uber, it's like, it's almost the same product, but Lyft just kind of had a different ethos of Maybe we can treat people a little better. I mean, we'll treat our employees a little better. We'll put forth a kind of a friendlier brand. And Lyft has just run laps around Uber in the last year. Uber's still a larger company, but, yeah. but Lyft has, has gained tremendous market share from Uber over the last year based off the one factor that they're just trying to do a little bit better in the world and try to just be a little bit nicer to people over time. Whereas I think if you went back 30 or 40 years ago, the companies that did the best were the companies that were the most aggressive. And, I, and so just part of our thesis is that that's just not going to be the case over the next 10 or 20 years. So we try to back companies that, are, uh, that have a social mission uh, in their, their strategy to do good in the world and kind of treat people as best as they can. And they're using that strategy as their competitive advantage over companies that haven't figured that out yet. Yeah. That's, uh, that's just fantastic, Morgan. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we, we all have our favorites. So we have our, you know, uh, favorite stock picks or our favorite, uh, you know, favorite recommendation for an investment class or favorite article. When you look back at your career, do you have a couple just highlights that you'd want to highlight? Um, I know, I mean, I know I read your article on capitalism and the power of a story that I thought was just an amazing 
article. Um, but but I don't know. What, what are kind of your favorites looking back or your favorite calls or your favorite articles? I think maybe not favorite articles, but I would say a favorite book that really kind of changed how, how I thought about investing quite a bit. Uh, and it's an older book. There was, there, there was a, a historian about 100 years ago named, named Frederick Lewis Allen. And he mm. wrote a trilogy on U.S. history. He wrote a book. Uh, one book was called The Big Change. And it was about how American culture changed from 1900 to 1950. And there was mm. another book called uh, Since Yesterday. And that was on America in the 1920s. And then this, the, the third book was called Only Yesterday. And that's on America in the 1930s. And there's just these fascinating history books about U.S. Uh, culture. And he focuses a lot about the economy and, and not necessarily investing, but just how the economy changed during this period. And mm. he just goes into like, what was everyday life like for the average American back then? What did they eat? Where did they get their information? What was work like? What was marriage life? What was school life? Like, what was their life like back then? And it just really opened my eyes to how, I think, like how much change there has been in not that long a time period, if we're just looking at the last, you know, since 1930, 80 years or so, how much has changed since then is just astronomical. And I think he put in, in such uh, clear terms what life was like back then that to compare it to life today was just astounding. And it just, it highlighted for me, I think, the power of capitalism, I would say. Like, look mm -hmm. at how much has changed just exponentially in the last 80 years. And, 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 and then you kind of start daydreaming about like, what is life going to be like 80 years from now? Like if we've, if we've changed this much in the last 80 years, what yeah. is life going to be like for, for, you know, for me when I'm, when I'm much older, but for my children, my grandchildren, like it, it, it was just a, a profound shift in how I thought about both capitalism and compounding, I would say, because that's really what the story is of change over time is just the power of compounding and compounding is always really easy to underestimate in the short run, what's going to happen over the next five or 10 years? Like, oh, there might be some big changes, but they're, they're not going to be that impressive. You probably won't even notice them on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you look at what's going to happen over the next 50 or 80 years, it's just staggering. So that, mm. I think, and I think that too, just kind of that framework brought, uh, I think, a deeper sense again of just like long-term thinking as one of the most important concepts in investing. Just again, just the power of compounding, like what happens in the next five or 10 years is not that impressive, but what can happen in the next 50 years is just sensational. So yeah. that, I, think, I think that book or that, you know, that piece of writing was, was probably the biggest kind of paradigm shift in my thinking. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, and then, and I, I would say too, just, you know, I would say early on in my career, I was most interested in, uh, specific stock picks and business analysis. And, I, and I, 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 I still am, but I definitely gained a much deeper appreciation for the bigger picture behavioral stuff over time. And that's just, I think that's just my personal preference. There are people out there that, you know, really still love digging into individual stock picks. And I think that's great, but I didn't, it's not that I lost interest in it, but I just got really fascinated with the 30,000 foot view of investing about how people think about risk and behavior versus the, 1,000 foot view of investing of, of markets and stock picks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so do you believe that there's going to be a shift in the next like 20 years from Wall Street to like Silicon Valley? Like, is that going to be a big change in finance? Or yeah. do you think we should still aim like Wall Street as the headquarters of finance? Oh, yeah, great question. And this has been like, that's a huge question over the past five years as FinTech kind of really came into the picture. And five years ago, the view was, well, of course that's going to happen. Like what you have these old banks run by these old guys with gray hair that are just based off of like technology made in the 1950s running these huge banks, most of which nearly went bankrupt 10 years ago and had to get bailed out by the government. So you have those banks competing against Silicon Valley, like the smartest programmers in the world and all this venture capital money and young people that understand how technology works. Like, how could Silicon Valley not disrupt Wall Street? So there's a big boot, you know, kind of surge in fintech investing over the past five to 10 years. And interestingly, even though five to 10 years is not that long a time, there has not been that much disruption, to be honest. I think much less than people thought. I think people are really realizing that the incumbent banks, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Bank of America, 
were much more entrenched than people realized. Some of that is due to regulation. Just those big banks have regulatory advantages that a small Silicon Valley startup can enjoy. And those banks are just so big too. All those banks have more than a trillion dollars in their balance sheet. Sometimes I think JP Morgan, Wells Fargo have two, maybe $3 trillion in their balance sheet. It's just so hard to compete against those banks because they're always going to have a cost advantage over a smaller bank. So I, I think the answer, and this is how, how you framed it, is there going to be a shift over the next 20 years? I'd say absolutely. And there already is in some parts of, of the financial market. I think companies like Betterment and Wealthfront have, have significantly shook up how Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley give financial advice. You have, you know, just looking at companies like Betterment that in five years you know, are really starting to give a lot of those large financial advisory firms a run for their money. Um, but you know, five or 10 years ago, the view was that, let's say by 2018, no one was going to have a checking account at JP Morgan anymore. They're all going to have some Silicon Valley bank, uh, you know, uh, bank that they did their banking at. And that hasn't been the case yet. I still think that'll be the case over time, but the big banks are, are really entrenched, but there's still, there's a lot of fascinating fintech startups and investments going on in Silicon Valley and way more exciting stuff in fintech there than there is anything going on in wall street there's almost no innovation on wall street it's all just they've had their process down you know for uh for 50 or 80 years and and, and they just kind of uh, keep that machine running not no innovation but very little innovation on wall street and when they and when they think they've innovated and they think they found a big idea oftentimes it ends up blowing up in their faces um so it's 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 less innovation and more just kind of uh, leverage so I, I, I would say, you know, just to, to sum up your question, I think, yes, yeah, so there, there will be a big change in the next 20 years, but it's happening slower than people thought it would. So um, with the technology you guys have been like driving companies and stuff and like startups. So I was just wondering, does that make you guys like more interactive now kind of like actually there together? So I missed the, the 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 last part of your question, but I think you said it, are are we more involved in like in the the, the cultural side of businesses? Was that was that is that it? Yeah, well, like when you invest in a business, you know, they're like, their business is a startup, so you pretty much like when you invest in a business or you have like you know, just like purely put your money on the label. Yeah, so I think I think what's you know what's interesting about startups is that since it's a startup, there's oftentimes not very much information to look at. Whereas if you're doing analysis on Coca-Cola, there's 50 years of, of annual reports that you can go back and look at. And there's tons of information that you can use uh, to analyze the company uh, to make your investment thesis. But for a startup, there's often little to no information to go off. These companies don't have 10 years of financials that you can look at and build your financial model to get an idea of what this company might be worth. And because of that, what becomes really important in the startup world uh, is, is summing up and judging the founders of a company just as, as people. Just like, do I trust you that you're going to have enough grit and determination and intellectual honesty to make this company work? And that's how you analyze companies at, at the venture stage since you don't have you know, other sources of information to go off of. So VC- How do you analyze grit- and determination. Yeah, that's, that's the hard part. <laughs> and it's, I mean, there's no, it's no, I mean, this, this really gets back to it. At, for other forms of finance, you can create a formula and say, this is how you do it. It fits in this framework. And even if it's not precise, you can come up with a framework to fit it in. Whereas at VC, it's truly uh, a people business. And I would relate it to, you know, how do you find the right spouse? There's no formula for that. You just got to meet someone and get to know them. And it takes a while to get to know them. And sometimes you get it right and sometimes you get it wrong, but there's no formula. It's just, you have to go out and learn from a person and view how they've operated in the past. How have you done with past projects? Uh, who have you worked with in the past? And what did, what did they say about how you worked? Uh, I think what's really important for me is how did someone deal with and cope with a stressful situation in the past? Like if you've like in your previous job or your previous company that you worked for, you know, what was the most stressful thing that you dealt with and how did you deal with it? 
And I think those kind of skills, um, viewing how people dealt with stress is something that is, it's, it's highly indicative of how they're likely to deal with stress in the future. So if someone dealt with stress poorly in the past, they're mm -hmm. probably going to deal with it poorly in the future. Um, and, and, and it's also one of, I think, the most critical skills, particularly in startups, where every startup goes through really stressful periods. So it's just, you know, it's, so VC is, I think, a monumentally softer form of investing than, say, private equity or leverage buyouts or something where it's heavily analytical, whereas VC is just heavily people business. It's not 100% people business. You still have to size up, you know, you have to do market sizing. And what is your, you know, uh, your, your cost of customer acquisitions and your unit economics? There's still uh, a finance modeling component to it, but it's much, uh, it's much softer than other forms of investing. I'll, I'll jump in with a question here, Morgan. Um, what... Um, so, so the markets are up last 2017 was a big year for the markets, um, you know, Dow up over 20%, um, by a lot of metrics, uh, valuation metrics, the markets seem to be pretty expensive. Um, you're a student of history and the markets, where do you see the markets today relative to history? I would say it's, it's yes, by, by almost any measure, you know, we are at not only high valuations, but near the highest valuations. So, so there's, there's that. And there's part of me that wants to say, well, that should make us cautious. Not necessarily that, that we know the market is going to crash anytime soon, but just that we should lower our expectations for future returns. I think that's the smartest way to think about it. And that's, there's like 80% of me that wants to say that. And then there's another 20% of me that wants to say, look, when we look at the PE ratio or CAPE valuations or price to sales or, you know, there are all these different valuation metrics and compare them over the last hundred years. Well, things have changed considerably over the last hundred years in many aspects. If you just look at the S and P 500, which, you know, for most valuation metrics, that's kind of the, the base index that people use. The composition of the S and P 500 has changed drastically over the last 50 or 60 years. The S and P 500 didn't even include banking stocks until the 1970s. And if you looked at how it was composed, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, it was a it was a bunch of utility companies uh, and in industrial companies that just because of how those companies operate, they're very they're very capital intensive. They're probably going to trade at a lower multiple than how the S and P 500 is composed today of technology companies like Facebook and Google and whatnot. So there have been a lot of changes just in the composition over time. There have been changes in how S and P 500 companies account for their earnings over time. And these are small changes. It's not drastically that you can like just all of a sudden justify today's valuations because of how these things have changed over time. But it's there have been enough changes over time to make me think that even though I, I desperately want to be a student of history and use history as kind of like a framework for the future, that I do, I think when people start comparing the current market environment to, you know, the average of the last hundred years, I think it can send people astray. And the best mm. example of that, is, you know, there's a valuation metric called CAPE, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. Uh, yeah. And you know, it was, and it's, 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 it's one of the most popular and I think most logical valuation uh, metrics. CAPE has been above its long-term average in all but nine months in the past 28 years. So when, uh, something, when something is above its average 98% of the time, maybe we should think that the average has changed. I, I, uh, I think that's, that's a reasonable way to think about it. But that's 20% that's, that's of me versus the 80% of me that says, yes, stocks are expensive. And that means we should just expect lower future returns. But I think there's a big important point to make there too, that just because stocks are expensive does not mean that we should expect them to crash in the next month or the next year. Because if you and I were having this conversation in 2012, yeah. we would be saying the yeah. same thing. Stocks are yeah. really expensive and they've gone up a lot. And that didn't mean that they were going to crash in the next year. It just meant that we should probably lower our expectations of returns over the next, say, decade. So that's how mm. I feel again today, too. It would not surprise me in the least if the market kept rising for another two or three or even five years. Um, I, I think that's, that's within, you know, that's within the kind of the, the normal confines of history, but it also wouldn't surprise me if the market crashed next month. I think, I, I think 
we, it's one thing to expect a level of return over a long period of time. But I think it's something completely different to say like what's going to happen next over the next six months or the one or next year. Yeah. Yeah. So well said. So insightful. So, um, what S and P companies over the next twenty years? Yeah, good question. And I think the way to frame that is, if if you if we were here in nineteen ninety eight, twenty years ago, answering that question, I guarantee you what we would have said is <laughs> lucent. Uh, <laughs> Enron, we almost certainly would have said Enron. Enron was like everyone's favorite company in 1990. <laughs> what, what else would we have said? We would have said Kodak. We would have said AIG. We would have said yeah. Lehman Circuit Brothers. City. Circuit City, right. And I think that, and if we went 20 years before that, we would have talked about like, oh, there's some steel company or like Commodore <laughs> Computers or something. I, I don't think there's ever been a 20-year period in history where any – well-educated person could really say this is going to be the next winner in the next 20 years. Um, there's a famous investor named Bill Miller, who's like truly one of the greatest investors of modern times. Famous investor. Everyone loves him. He has a great track record. I found an article that he wrote in 2000. I believe it was the year 2000. And the article was like 10 stocks for the next decade. And I'm not making this up. I'll try to find it. His 10 stock picks for the next decade were Enron, AIG, Kodak. <laughs> yeah, I, I forget all. You go down the list and like it couldn't have been worse. It was like the worst stock pick you could possibly imagine. And this, I think, there's a couple of lessons for this. Like one is, you know, the, the importance of good diversification in this. Of like, if you have enough diversification, you don't truly need to know what are going to be the few companies that are going to do the best over the next 20 years. But it's also just, it just instills a lot of humility in the investing process to look back. And this is where history is really important to study history as an investor, to look back at, again, like what were people saying in 1998 about the next 20 years through today? And no one had a clue. No one had a clue what was going to happen in the next 20 years or what industries were going to do well over the next 20 years. You had vague ideas of, okay, the, the internet is going to do well over the next 20 years. People are saying that in 1998. And they were right about that, but there were so many different layers that they didn't get. They had no concept of social media. They had no concept of mobile. They had no concept that, you know, two companies, Facebook and Google, were going to capture 80% of the online advertising market or whatever it is. Like there were so many things that were the most important things to know that people didn't know back then. So even if they had the broad concept, right, of the internet is going to be huge, Everything that you needed to know to really make money as an investor over the, over the subsequent 20 years, nobody knew back then. <laughs> so, and, and a lot of that is because even if we go back 20 years ago, people were really excited about the internet. I mean, Google was started in 1998, but no one really knew about it for several years after that. Facebook wasn't even close to being founded. And those are the two companies that made by far the most money out of the internet. And no one was talking about them in 1998. So I, I can... I would, I would be almost certain that if we were talking 20 years from now about what companies did the best over the previous 20 years, from 2018 to 2038, what companies did the best, it would be, it would be a company and an industry that is either not around yet, or if it's around today, is it's just a startup that nobody's talking about. Um, and I would be completely mm. surprised if 20 years from now, if anyone is even talking at all about Facebook and Google and Apple, maybe they'll still be around. I'm sure they'll still be around, but I think, you know, they'll be around in the same way um, that, you know, Walmart's still around and it's still a great company making a lot of money, but no one really, in terms of like, in terms of innovation and a great investment and whatnot, no one really talks about it anymore. And I wouldn't be surprised too, if there were some huge names you know, I'm making this up, it's not forecast, but Google or Facebook or, or Uber or Apple that don't exist in 20 years. I think that's, that's the history of markets. You know, there's, it's, a, it's a brutally competitive place in the history of companies, especially companies that get really successful to a point where they can start uh, letting their guard down and getting cocky about things. Those are the companies that tend to go out of business over time. So 
you know, if we were talking 40 years ago about what's, what's the best company to own, I think a lot of people probably would have said Sears. Uh, and Sears has been like, it's, it's people talk about Sears today because they're talking about it as like, when, when is it going to go bankrupt kind of thing? So <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, I think when we're talking about 20 year periods, diversification gets so important because the history of 20 year periods and markets is just at the individual company level is really humbling. Mm. So good. So good. I, sorry, it's kind of loud in here now. That's okay. You still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, in your opinion, what's the best ratio for the stock bond diversified portfolio? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, so I think the 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 right answer it's the it's the <coughs> answer that people don't want to hear, but the right answer is it depends. And I I think it it's not necessarily that it depends on your age. It just it depends on your your disposition, like your ability to handle risk. I think there are people who can be in retirement and have 100% of their money in stocks because they have the mentality and the psychology that if the market were to fall 50%, they would be okay. And they'd still sleep fine at night and they would not panic and sell everything. And then there are young people who maybe in their, in their teens or 20s who should have most, if not all of their money in cash and bonds because they don't have the right temperament to be long-term investors. Mm. Uh, and so it's not necessary. I think normally when this topic is discussed, it's well, it's, you know, it depends how old you are and their formula is like a hundred minus your age or whatever it is. That's what it should, you should be in stocks or wh whatever those formulas are. I think those are good rules of thumb. But I think for me in, in practical purposes, it's just what is your tolerance for risk? And that tolerance is heavily just based off of who you are as a person, not necessarily what your age is. And how I like to frame all this, and it takes a little bit of time to learn about this about yourself, is you know, how did you behave in the previous bear market? So for us, this is probably, you know, I, I don't think many of you were, were investing back then, but for, for older investors, we, I, we always like to say, like, what did you do in 2008? How did you behave in 2008 when the market collapsed? Did you panic and sell? Were you totally okay with it? Did you view it as an opportunity and you bought a lot more? Because that behavior is gonna be really indicative of how you're gonna behave, if how you're gonna behave in the next bear market. So if, like, you know, in terms of like being a financial advisor, this is what, this is what we, we would like to tell people. Like, if you did panic in 2008, then you probably have a pretty low risk tolerance. And no matter what you think today or how bullish you feel today in 2018, you should probably have a pretty good percentage of your money in bonds. Because you've proven by your past behaviors that you don't have much tolerance for risk. And even though you don't like being in bonds today because you say, oh, they learn a low return, stocks are going to do better you're probably going to do better in bonds because the devastation that you do to your wealth in stocks, if you panic and sell in a 2008 like moment when you're, you know, there's a big bear market and you know, the, the pain that that does to your portfolio is 10 times worse than the pain you're going to get from owning low returning bonds over your, the course of your lifetime as an investor. So that's, I mean, that's, that's how I would, I would sum up the question and say there's no, I, I truly don't think there's a good formula of what it should be. You just have to get to know yourself as an investor over time and go with it from there. I myself, I, I have probably a lower risk tolerance than most traditional financial advisory formulas would put me in. For my age and my income bracket, I think most, most people would say, oh, I, I should have X percent of my assets in stocks. And for me personally, I kind of say like, oh, like, thank you, but I'm going to have a little bit less. I, I have more cash than most people think I need, but, that, but I, I like that. It helps me sleep at night and it helps me feel safe and it helps me take a longer term view that I know that since I have this much cash in the bank, my wife and my son are going to be fine if something happens to me or happens to my job or if there's a bad recession. And because of that, now I can take a long term view so that the stocks that I do own, I truly can hold those stocks for 40 or 50 or 60 years. So that's, that's just how I think about it in general. That is so good. That's some of the best, best financial advice I've probably ever heard. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I know we, I know we need to wrap it up at, at some point. How do we have any more questions from California? Maybe one last question and then, um, 
and then and then we'll we'll finalize. Yes, I don't think we have any more questions on this last one. This will probably be our last one. So. Okay. Um, okay. So I think I have time for one more. Uh, how important do you think risk assessment is in the most is there a lot more job opportunities for that? Sorry, is that, is that, is that job opportunities for risk assessment? Yeah. So, yeah, I would say it's changed a lot because a lot of the risk models that were really popular before 2008 were shown to be not very useful after 2008 because a lot of the risk models, you know, in 2007 predicted smooth sailing ahead. Um, and so, you know, how has things, how has things changed since then in terms of, you know, risk management? I think, uh, how, would I, how would I put this? I would say, I mean, on, on, on one hand, a lot of those models were just thrown out and people don't really use them anymore. On the other hand, you know, jobs that have really blown up and, and done really well on Wall Street in the last years are people with deep science and math backgrounds mm -hmm. that, that can make really super fancy, sophisticated risk models, much more sophisticated than they've ever done, you know, in, in, in the past and, and leveraged by, by some of the, the, the best and fastest computers out there. Uh, so, I mean, try, try, just, just trying to think this through, because that's, that's a really good question. But I'd say a, a lot of the old models were kind of just uh, high level theoretical concept of risk, whether that was things like capital asset pricing model and whatnot, which is a not very complicated, but somewhat sophisticated way to measure how investors should think about how, you know, the percentage of stocks and bonds that they should own. I think those kind of models are, are, are largely being thrown out and they're being replaced by really sophisticated uh, big data kind of AI type models to, to, to measure risk over time. What I think is the most important part of this, though, is that it's to be determined how those models end up doing. You never know how your risk model is going to perform until it's really tested in a big way like 2008. And a lot of the new models that have, have been invented and put into use in the last 10 years haven't been tested yet. And I think, I, I think when they are tested, whenever the next big recession is, I think we'll learn that a lot of them didn't work very well. And I think the, the reason that they don't work, and I'm, I'm – cautious that I think they will ever work it is, is again because you can't measure and predict human behavior with, with data and formulas it's just like people how people respond to incentives is based mm. off of emotions which is like adrenaline and dopamine and it's not something that you can really summarize even with big data and AI it's just not something that you can really put into a formula and say this is what the economy is going to do in February 2022 People desperately want to do that, but I just think there's so much evidence that we can't. And because of that, just maybe, maybe this is wrapping it up. Because of that, I think if you accept the humility that we're less able to predict what's going to happen next than we, than we want to, the solution for me, or this, this is how I think about it, is like, is okay, then how can I set up my personal finances and my career and just how I think about life in general to in, rather than try to uh, predict and avoid those ups and downs, to just try to endure them over time. To just say, look, there's gonna be recessions, there's gonna be bear markets. I don't know when, and I'm not gonna try to predict when and avoid it. I'm just gonna set myself up so that when it happens, I can just kind of ride it out uh, so that, so that I, I can stick around for the longest period of time and let compounding work its magic over 50 or 60 or 70 years, rather than trying to pinpoint what's gonna happen in the next year. Yeah. Morgan, this has been this has been so good. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot to finalize, if you don't mind. Um, sure. You've been honestly one of the best speakers that we've had, and you're incredibly knowledgeable. So Thanks. I'd like to put you on the spot for for kind of a personal address to Young Investor Society members, and then maybe maybe it's a minute or two, and then we'll uh, we'll use that clip and you know blast it all over youtube and make sure that that all the kids see it so maybe if you could just kind of wrap it up and just address you know the the thousands of kids uh throughout the world and what advice would you give them for you know in just a minute 
Yeah, I would say the single most important part of investing is time. How much time do you have to invest? And that's how compounding works. It's something that takes place over 50 or 60 or 70 years. And that's something that you as a young investor has way more of than I do or Warren Buffett does. And it's a huge asset that you have in your pocket. Just the fact that you have decades in front of you to invest. And that is such a valuable and powerful asset. And I would just encourage everyone to, to, uh, to recognize how powerful it is that you have many decades in front of you to invest and start learning as soon as you can so that you can utilize and leverage that asset as best as you can. And by the time you're older, even when you're in your 20s or 30s, but particularly as you get into your 50s or 60s or 70s, people who started investing in their teens and 20s have so much advantage over people who started investing in their 30s and 40s. Not just a little bit, not just 10 years more, but it's just exponentially more over time. So I think if anyone can really get serious about investing in their teens and 20s, they're setting themselves up for, I think, a, a really fun and rewarding career and just lifetime as an investor. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, California, do you want to, do you want to sign off and say, say, uh, say your goodbyes? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah that was fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was fun. Take care. See you guys. <laughs> so Morgan, thank you so much for your time. We, we appreciate it. And on behalf of young investor society, I mean, this honestly means the world to us. And I, I am sincere that this is one of the best most well, insightful we've had we've had yet and and honestly we hope to have you on again because this is fantastic yeah no no totally i'd, I'd love to this is fun this is fun I all appreciate right it. This is cool thanks right, morgan guys. have a great night thanks you bye. too bye.